What motivated you to create a $9 computer? Uh, yeah, so it didn't actually start as a $9 computer. It started as this, Auto, which was a hackable animated GIF camera. Um, this one is actually not one we've shown before. It has a clear uh, back, so you can see what's going on. It was the first uh, project powered by the Raspberry Pi Compute Module. Uh, we launched this on Kickstarter about a year ago, and it's been you know, an amazing project, and we had to figure out how to build it, and we also, you know, had to figure out how to make it and keep it sustainable. Sure. And we sold Auto for about $249 at retail, and we found that at that price, a four-person company just wasn't able to keep its doors open. And we realized that, hey, if we're going to make this, this camera and we want as many people as possible to have them so they can hack these cameras and have fun with them, make animated GIFs, whatever it may be, um, it needed to be 100 bucks. And the only way for it to be $100 is if you look at two and a half times the bill of materials, you start thinking, okay, well, how much if you feel the camera? You know, it's got some machine parts and the plastics. It's like, well, computer like and all the electronics have to be between like 15 bucks or less. And when you really drill down on it, you're like, well, it's got to be less than $10. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we sort of started this process of figuring out how we could build something to make auto cheaper to make so we could give it to more people. But also, you know, in that process, sort of enable people like us, you know, people who just make stuff and want to sort of go a little bit bigger, so return to a cottage industry, and, and uh, how they could, we could enable that. And that's where, you know, we came back from China after we figured out how to do it and had all the partnerships and things figured out. And we're just like, well, okay, well, we can make the camera cheaper, but maybe this thing we made is interesting on its own. <laughs> um, and you'd be amazed, like, when you do something in complete secrecy and you think it's one thing. And, you know, we had this sort of all sort of all hands meeting, you know, all, all the few people that were at the company at this point, you know, like seven or eight of us. And, uh, like, what if nobody cares? Like, we should probably ask people if they think what we did is, number one, interesting, and number two, like, if they even understand it, because it's, it's kind of an, a strange-looking thing. Um, and it turns out, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it came to be. Interesting. Yeah. So what are the things that make a $9 computer possible? Is it open source? Is it scale? Well, uh, two of the most important things are, um, you know, what components we pick and the community of people on Kickstarter who supported it. So, you know, when we say in the Kickstarter video that we need to order things in enormous quantities, very large quantities, we mean it. Um, and, you know, the essence of Kickstarter is such that if somebody shows, shares an idea with you and they have a prototype, but they need a, to order a lot of things and they need the support of a community to get their volumes up so that it's made, it's made possible, sort of a group buy on steroids, um, we are one of those projects. Like, we needed the community support so that we could actually buy enough components to actually make this thing. And you know, that mixed with the technology that we use in the actual chipboard um, is you know, not state of the art. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's actually not a, not a very good computer by today's standards, uh, but it's a phenomenal computer for $9. Right. So what we've done is you know, we've worked with All Winner very directly to take the processor from very, very popular, very cheap Android tablets that you can buy for $49 at Walmart or Kmart or wherever um, and say, well, what if we just took all the tablet parts off of it and we put that onto the smallest possible board you can imagine and we had it do all the things that we needed to invent to make auto possible, power supplies, battery charging, Wi-Fi, just put it all in there. And what if we made it, and instead of being a tablet person, we just said, hey, tablet guys, make us the thing, but lose the screen, lose the battery. <laughs> How much does it cost now? Yeah. And they're like, well, if you buy a lot of them, it's really cheap. And I'm like, well, let's do that. Right. And that, that's, I mean, it's, there's no real magic to it um, other than you... You know, you have to buy things in an enormous scale, and there's all these other sort of little um, benefits that we've reaped from this product that was kind of forgotten, right? Nobody really wants an Android 4.0 tablet with an 8-inch display, mm -hmm. you know, um, and we use a 55 nanometer silicon die in the chip, which is not new technology. I mean, you saw IBM has like a 7 nanometer chip now, and so like, well, you know what, like, the question is not what is this like perfect intersection of size, high speed, and usually high cost. We're just like, how good a computer can we make right. for less than 10 bucks? And that's chip. It you know. sounds like it's at a good enough level. That's how right? we feel about it, yeah. And it's it's kind of like, um, we're, we're very much interested in like, you know, we had this experience of, of building auto and, you know, building our own Linux, uh, Linux kernel and distribution, building the drivers and, you know, engineering all this. And we're like, you know, like, in the spirit of the open source, you know, we've, uh, us, my, myself personally and the team, we've you know, stood on the shoulders of giants, right? Like, 
so much of the work that we have done would have not been possible without the commitments of, of the open source community and all these libraries and tools that we use. And it felt like in the hardware world, like we're getting there, mm. and, but as long as I've been doing we still haven't reached that awesome spot where like, oh, you want to build something? Well, there's five versions of it already built and you can just like mix and match and then just clean it up to do what you want. Um, and part of that is you have to do it right, you know, one time first. Mm -hmm. And because of all the different disciplines that this thing touches on, you need to have you know, firmware engineers, hardware engineers, RF guys, Linux guys, driver guys, you know, uh, industrial design folks. Like, we are trying to get it right one time and open source all of it and say like, hey, like, this is how you do it. Mm -hmm. And now we have a very affordable, completely open design that we can all use as a sort of basis of, hey, I want to build something with a tiny computer and I want to be able to, you know, not spend too much money on it, maybe like build it cheap enough that I can just leave the computer in it. Um, and that's, yeah, I mean, that's kind of how it all came together in that way. This is a big question. Sure. But what do you think is possible when everybody has uh, access to it? It's computer? an enormous, it's an enormous, enormous question. And if, if, if I could give that question the justice it deserves, I'd have no time to build the computers. <laughs> um, and seeing as we have 40,000 people eagerly awaiting them, I, I, I'm frightened by it. But what I can say is that, like the we in one of the updates that we did during the campaign, we asked the community. You know, like um, at that time, there was I think maybe 15,000 people. Um, hey, what are you going to use chip for? And it's crazy to think that like we made this thing, and we we have our own ideas, right? I mean, we made auto and things like it, and we made pocket chip, which is another sort of example. Um, but that we didn't really know. And that's sort of the most exciting thing for us. You know, when we say in the video, uh, which is, it's kind of like, we, you know, the, the, the script is kind of like, well, what are we really trying to say? It's like, we actually are really excited about what people could do with it. Mm -hmm. And a big part of this project is just finding out. You know, and that's, that's where, you know, why, why we're so focused on getting these things out the door. Because I, the team can no longer sort of contain <laughs> the, the, the sort of excitement and anxiety of like, oh man, right. yeah. What's your take on the term Internet of Things? I, I don't really know what it means. Um, is, that, is that an answer? It's a perfectly good answer. <laughs> okay, all right, yeah. fair enough, yeah. yeah. Um, this is kind of a weird question. But sure. What is the single biggest technical issue that you are running into right now? Ooh, biggest technical issue running into right now. Um, you know, it turns out, like, uh, we made, and we're still shipping autos to Kickstarter backers, and we made uh, around 500 auto cameras. Um, so far, through Kickstarter, we haven't opened pre-orders yet. We have um, pre actually uh, orders for 50,000 chips. So that's two orders of magnitude, mm -hmm. right? And you know, how do you take the sort of our, our crew of hackers that made this thing, you know, with the support of some very large partners? How do you scale this up to a place where as many people that want chip can get it? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that. As broken as a lot of the things in, you know, the single board computer space or embedded Linux, like you can make it work, but it's hard. When you think about supply chain and like how you actually get something from a person in one place from a factory in another place, or how you get the firmware or the OS or the U boot onto the right chips in the right place. If you want to talk about localization, how do you make sure that the German chips get the German instructions? Sure. This sort of, it seems sort of mundane, but it's actually really fascinating. And it turns out like, you know, there's those, those commercials you see online that's like, you know, such and such company helps you with your global supply chain. Right. And you're like, who is that for? Right. Right? And so the first time, like I'm walking through an airport to come here and I'm like, oh yeah, I need that. <laughs> I need whatever that is. I don't know what this company does, but I need it. Right. Um, and so we're, you know, in the spirit of, of everything that we do, like um, we're, we're trying to sort of do it our, our own way, but also learn from all the stuff that people have done. And we have this amazing community of sort of mentors and, and some of our investors who have this lots of experience in this sort of stuff. But be like, you know, like we're probably not going to be the last group of guys who does something like this. I, I would almost guarantee it. Yeah. So if we can figure it out, and we can maybe make some things to make it easier and then share that with people, like that would be awesome, mm -hmm. right? Because you, you could imagine, you know, like three people get together. Wouldn't it be cool if like they could also sell 50,000 of something? Like I don't want that to be a one-time thing. And you know, there's no sense. And in the spirit of, of, you know, of Linux and the whole open source world, it's like if somebody finds a solution to a problem and it's, it's reproducible, and you document it, and you put it out there with you know the right license. Um, people 
pretty much aren't going to redo it just for the sake of redoing it. Sure. I mean, they'll re-implement it in Go or re-implement it in you know JavaScript, which will be fun. Looking forward to that. Uh, but no, it, and that's that's it. Is sort of um, it is both the the biggest challenge that we have, and also one of the most exciting things. It's like. We made 500 or something before, and now we are, I can say, up to our eyeballs in this problem. <laughs> um, and it's a whole new set of toys to play with that we never even imagined we would get to touch. And like, you, you think the 3D printers are exciting, factories are exciting, right. right? Material comes in one side, cardboard boxes come out the other. It's just, it's so cool. Related to that question, what was the biggest issue you were encountering five years ago? Five years ago? Um, oh man, I don't, I can't remember what five years ago I was doing. I mean, I can I can tell you pretty universally. I mean, I, I've been, you know, me and, and all my my artist friends, um, a lot of whom now work with me and founders of the company. Um, you know, we we really struggled to build physical devices that did sort of magical things, um, and. You know, it was just there's so much legwork you had to do, like to get Linux running on something, um, and it's not for lack of trying or for lack of good, good community. It's just a function of, you know, embedded Linux is really popular in products and in all kinds of different systems. It's all around us all the time, but these products, like they're, they're made and they sort of freeze the kernel version and like it works awesome. Like, you know, the the QA department has signed off on it. Nobody change anything. Here's the gold master. Awesome, okay, so now we're to get compliance, we're gonna release the source code. Awesome, cool. Well, that model of a release doesn't really jive with the way things happen now. I mean, like, post SourceForge now on GitHub, like, if it's not in a pull request, it, it doesn't exist, you know? <laughs> um, and so that was one of the sort of immensely difficult things for us is like, oh, like, so I, I actually, you know, found this guy's website and I created a zip uh, archive of you know all of his content on his personal Git server uh, because it's down now, and he's got the one version of you know, Linux 3.4 with a special patch that works with the Realtek drivers. And like, I love that guy. That's awesome. Look that he did it. It all is amazing. Um, but it just it means that everyone was redoing the work, and like we lived that, and we were redoing the work, mm -hmm. and like. Um, when you just, I mean, it's such a simple idea. When you just want to make a camera that makes animated GIFs, it's like, that won't take that long. You know, and, you know, when you, when you see all the things that Otto does and, like, getting to a place where a, a person who is not, you know, f fluent in this sort of Linux world and just bought Otto because I want to make animated GIFs. They're awesome. Giving them the experience of turning the thing on, pairing it with their phone, turning a little crank, and then sharing that GIF, that is really hard. And most of the most difficult things that happen, you would think, are like building the product, making the design decisions, implementing the actual software that takes the GIFs. But it turns out it took us almost a year just to build the infrastructure Is that, th right? that the software runs on top of. Oh. And so, you know, it was very hard. I mean, because we're small, we're a small company, and it was just kind of like people joke about full stack, you know, it's like, well, you know, in, in any, between lunch and dinner, you know, there's a conversation about like, well, what kind of RAM are we going to use, and this, you know, selecting this processor, and you know, interconnects, and then like, well, you know, are we going to write it in C or C++ 11? And, oh man, like, what's our process runner going to be? Like, oh, you know, we should probably switch to build root. Like, I don't really like this situation we have. And so, we got to this point where we were touching so many different pieces that it just slowed to a crawl. And so, going forward, I know I'm not going to sort of reinvent the wheel again, and I want to do everything I can so that nobody else has to do that, because it was fun, it was interesting, you know, but it's a bit like people are sailing off, you know, into the, into the sunset to go explore, you know, uncharted territory, and they have paper, and they have a pencil, and they have a guy with, like, a sextant and a cartographer, and they have a map of the stars, and they just don't make a map of what they find. Mm -hmm. and, right. and it's just like, man, it's really hard out there. I wish you guys could have seen it, you know? <laughs> like, everybody's dead except for me. Yeah. Like, I have scurvy, but, like, yeah. did you have a map? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, dude, I, there was no time for that. Yeah. yeah. So last question sure. for you. What people or projects are you following these days? Oh, man, I was so excited to um, come to Portland. And, you know, we, we're, we make computers, right? We're, we're, and cameras, and, um, you know, we... Uh, we also just we just like people making things, and it's really exciting to us to see guys and, and you know girls like us who just a few people getting together and pulling it off, and then seeing their products you know sort of in stores all over the world. And so Tanner Goods here in Portland is one of my favorite companies. I have I've had their wallet in my pocket since I moved to China to work on Auto, and like 
It's it's just an amazing thing, and it's it's really low tech. It's like the antithesis of what we do, but it's very much in line with how we think and feel about things. They care about the tiniest detail. They're all about you know how do we give people a fantastic experience with the product, and you know how do we how do you get your own craft and craftsmanship into it, and you know this idea of like you know, we 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 do a lot of software engineering, and but like we try and make sure that our personality and our craft comes through in our work. And so we look at people like that and like, wow, those guys can do it. If you can get, you know, when I'm in Hong Kong, if I can get a Tanner Goods wallet in Hong Kong, maybe I can get a chip too. You know, maybe I can, there can be one in Paris as well. So like, we look at them and it's just, it's a, it's a total um, inspiration. And then, you know, we're, we were a camera company at one time, you know, um, and so we are huge camera nerds. And so it's, it's always awesome to see companies doing interesting stuff with cameras. Um, you know, cameras more and more, they're computers, right? And so the, I, this people's first sort of encounter with off software updates that aren't phones, it's usually their camera mm -hmm. if they have one. Um, so Fuji is a company that we just sort of admire endlessly because actually I have one of their new X100Ts in my bag, you know, because short of auto, it's, it's the camera that we all lusted after and, and carry now um, because they're like, they went against the grain. They said, look, look, we want to create this tangible experience. We really want to like get people excited about photography again and we're going to reinvent the wheel to do it. You wouldn't think that in a market what's all about DSLRs and megapixels and all that, they, somebody would come out and would say, you can't take the lens off. And you know what? Like, we made a whole new sensor. Why did we do it? Because we wanted to create that feel of Fuji film again. You know, it's it's like an in, it's it's purely like seems like oh that's a niche thing. They sell almost a million of those cameras a year, and it saved the company. Mm -hmm. and it's this awesome thing, and to see that you can do what excites you, and make it not just sustainable but make it successful. Like we we cling to those stories because like that's what we've always tried to do. Right. Well, thanks so much for being with us. Yeah, absolutely.